All right. Good morning. Good to see you. Looking forward to some snow tomorrow. Anybody? Oh, yeah. Okay. Some are. Yes. Yes. Okay. Teachers in the crowd are. Okay. Great. All right. Well, I, I hope it's a good day for you then. Um, I hope it's a good day for everybody. And uh, the people are safe out there. Um, we don't know uh, what's actually happening with weather any given time, but uh, we do know that the Lord's watching over us. So why don't we turn to him and, and then we'll open the service. Thank you, Lord, for um, the opportunity to come into your house and for just simply to worship just to set everything aside and worship. We're, we're grateful, in fact, that, that you're watching over us. Whether, whether it's a sunny, bright day or a stormy day, you're with us, and, and we're grateful for that. And sometimes um, we lose sight of that. Today is one of those days that bring us back into focus so that we don't lose sight of that completely. Um, as we worship, as we look at your word, oh God, um, please meet with us by your spirit so that when we go and go through our week, um, it, it just kind of keeps us energized and focused, full of faith and full of a, a desire really to work for the kingdom's good. Um, and so we just, we just offer you this time of worship as, as an act of love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Why don't we stand for a little bit? and uh, do some singing.
His praises, honor and glory be unto your name, be unto your name. We are the broken, you are the healer, Jesus Redeemer. Mighty to say, you are the love song we'll sing forever, bowing before you, blessing your name. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty,
place for me I'm a child of God Yes I am Child of God Yes I am So deep. 
just stand for a second and soak that truth in. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for us. You are the great lover of souls. You, you come and you heal our thoughts and our emotions and our bodies. You come and fix the things we don't even realize are broken in us. We're in awe, O oh God, of you. Be blessed and adored and loved in this place today. Lord, I pray that you'd continue to heal. Touch those who need a touch in their bodies. Touch those who need a touch in their minds. Touch those who need a touch in their emotions, relationships, their finance, their jobs, their schooling. Let there be such healing that flows from the heart of the Father into us and through us to people around us that people would know that there's a God in heaven. Oh God, bless you. Bless you, oh Jesus. Bless you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. 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 Please have a seat. I feel particularly animated today, so I think I'll move everything back a bit further, just in case. Um, if, uh, if you didn't already, please, please take an opportunity to, to grab one of the communion cups. We'll have uh, communion a little bit later. <clears throat> All right. If you could check out Luke chapter 17. Today, instead of talking about missional specifically, that's kind of what I do, right? I talk about missional, mission. Um, that's, that's what we're all doing, in fact, as we live each day. I'm just going to leave that hanging in the air for a little bit, okay? And I'm, I'm going to talk about healing. You know, the healing that you're probably thinking about is a personal, physical, possible physical healing. And that's not exactly where I'm going. I want to talk about what, what can only be known really as the ministry of salvation. And we see it in this passage. Uh, uh, I told you, right? Luke 17, verse 11 is where we're starting. What I would like for us to realize is that the healing that God intends is a total healing. Completeness, wholeness is really the goal here. That's where, that's where God's going. And this is where he's going through the ministry that Jesus has. This is where he goes through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And this is where he goes when he invites us into his ministry. Whether it's reconciliation, whether it's service, you know, whatever it is specifically. This is where the heart of the Father is. All right, so uh, Luke 17, starting at verse 11. Uh, speaking about heading towards, um, heading towards the cross, really. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. 
They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, <laughs> We're not all ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Today, Lord, I, I really hope and pray that we get, we get the truth of this passage very, very clearly and very deeply into our own hearts and our own spirits that we would not look at healing the same way again. We would look at it the way you see it. All right, so... We start with 10 men with leprosy. We don't know who they are. We don't know other than what we hear in this passage, what's going on. We just know they have leprosy. And we've heard about leprosy. We don't really see it as much these days. It was certainly a, a skin affliction, but um, possibly because there wasn't a lot of medication. Um, we've probably had it ourselves. We just were able to go and get medication to kind of clear it up. So it was very common, but it was thought of as very contagious as well. So there was a distance required for lepers to keep from clean people. They could associate with each other, okay? They could, in a way, they could, they could be friends. But it was only friends simply because they couldn't be friends with their actual friends or their family. And so there's ten of them. And they come to Jesus, and they say, have pity on us. They believed that Jesus was a healer. They believed Jesus could speak it, touch, he had touched, by the way, a leper, and cleansed the leper in the past. Why he doesn't hear is very remarkable, and we have to keep note of why he doesn't hear. But I'm glad he doesn't. He just says, go to the priest. Show yourself to the priest. Now, the, the regulation is, if you are cleansed, you go and get certified. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the priest is the one that certifies you that you are no longer a leper and allows you then to go back to your family or whatever else. The interesting thing here with Jesus, he says this before they're cleansed. Go show yourself. <laughs> they had to have faith to believe that he would heal them, to turn around and head off to the priest. That in itself is pretty remarkable, is it not? But the astounding thing comes in a moment. Because you would think that healing would be enough. If you are healed, if God miraculously touched you in whatever way it is that you need Him to heal you, wouldn't that be enough for your faith? Apparently it's not always. Apparently some of us are pretty hard-hearted. And in this case, nine in 10. <laughs> now I don't know about you and I don't know an official statistic, but I feel like this is probably pretty true to the real statistic. The ones who are touched on this planet, which is 100% of the people, by the way, God has shown his love to. Only one in 10 respond to him. That's terrible. In any sport, that's a terrible statistic. 10%. In any <laughs> business, <laughs> government agency, <laughs> um, any line of thinking, 10% is terrible. And yet that's, that's the stat. But further... 
the one wasn't even one of Jesus' people. He was a Samaritan. Samaritans were a cross between believers in the Judaic God and believers in just idols. Okay, like they were. Just, <laughs> You ever heard of synergism? <laughs> it's just making something up based on some truth and things you want. Okay? Mashing a bunch of ideas together and going, that's my new religion. That's what Samaritans were. So when Jesus calls him a foreigner, it's pretty accurate. This guy, of all people, this guy's the one that comes back and says, thank you? The others were following the rule. When Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest, they took it as a, a rule. We gotta show ourselves to the priest in the way they went. And they were healed because of their faith. But this man found a further healing. Interesting. As they went, three simple words that you wouldn't normally uh, associate with anything useful makes a whole lot of sense here. As they went, in the process of something is where they found their healing. Jesus didn't heal them by saying, be healed, now go you know, see the priest. He said, go show yourself to the priest. That's all he said. He didn't say they would be healed. He just said, go show yourself to the priest. He, he didn't offer them anything. He didn't, he didn't promise anything. Go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were healed. Hmm. There is an act there that each of them did correctly. They believed Jesus and they were healed. And then only one realizes it and says, I gotta do something about it. Now there's all sorts of reasons why he does this that we don't know about. There's all sorts of reasons why the other nine don't come back and, and thank him that we don't know about. But there's probably only about nine, uh, say five possibilities. But here's the real, the real issue. They didn't believe him as Lord and Savior. They didn't see him as he is. They saw him as they wanted to see him. They saw him as somebody who could fix them. And then once they're fixed, they can go back to their other life and do what they were doing before. And it's a well-known fact, I guess, that Jews and Arabs don't get along. But when they both have leprosy, they do. Because they have to. They, there's lots of historical cases of, of that happening. And once they're healed, they go back to the way they were. Not realizing, hey, we had a friendship of sorts because of a common affliction. They went back to their old biases and grudges. Which I think speaks to a lot of social issues today, doesn't it? Whether it's racial, right, or gender things. We, we, we like our old biases. <laughs> we don't see people the way Jesus sees them. If we can't even see Jesus the way he is, how can we see other people the way Jesus sees them? One came back. And, and it brings to mind this verse for the other nine. And I, and I probably shouldn't continue to harp on about those nine, but it just brings to mind this verse, Romans chapter 1, 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God or gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They are the ones who have the promise, these nine. 
the promise of the land, the promise of the seed, the promise of eternity. And they're okay with getting a physical healing of their skin condition. This really talks to you about the old Jacob and Esau thing, right? When Esau easily sells his birthright so he can have a bite to eat. Missing completely the plan of God. Right? One comes back. One says thanks. Maybe he wasn't stuck in formality like the other nine were of, okay, I've got to go show myself to the priest. I don't know. But at least he comes back. And he falls at Jesus' feet. And he offers simple praise to God. Probably doesn't even have the right words to say. He's just, thank you, God. Just truly humble in his heart. And Jesus asks a couple of questions, but they're, they're somewhat rhetorical. The one that stands out to me was no one found to return and praise to God except this foreigner. Was no one? <laughs> he's, he's hurt. Do, 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 do you have the hint of the, the hurt from Jesus in that, in that question? There's something there, and you can't necessarily say it's a certain emotion. It's just you can tell there's some hurt there. I wouldn't say he's bitter. I'm just saying you can feel the hurt out of that question. Because these are the nine that should be giving thanks first. They should be leading the, the Samaritan, hey, we've got to go say thanks before we continue. Oh, yeah, okay. That should be what happens. These are God's people. But that's not what happens. And Jesus is kind of in a moment of wonder and hurt. Was no one found to return? Because he was honestly thinking of the nine. Truly. Truly showing them the love and, and compassion of the heart of God. Was no one to return? And now we, we see something quite remarkable. Immediately after his question, he says, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. And this is the healing that we need. We truly need. This is the healing that this whole world needs. And the healing really that we need to not just accept and take it home with us, we need to let people know. Do you want to be healed? When Jesus asked that question to people, do you want to be healed? I don't think it was simply, you've got an, some sort of a condition, sickness, whatever it is. Do you want to be healed? Well, obviously. He was actually asking the deeper meaning. Do you want to be whole? Because that wholeness is, is really the, the reason he came. We think of it in terms of the word salvation, but that's only part of the word, part of the meaning of that wholeness. Healing is another part of the meaning. Made complete. Do you remember the, the verse where his stripes have healed us? The meaning of that is the same thing as I'm talking about here. It's not his stripes have healed us, it's his stripes have made us complete. By his stripes we're healed. Yes, but it's a complete healing. It's our minds, the redemption of our minds that we don't have to follow after sin. The redemption of our affections that we don't have to lust, the redemption of our bodies that we don't break, the redemption of our souls that we might see God. That's what the healing is. That's, that's the idea that, that's coming out of this passage, but that's the actual meaning from Isaiah. By his stripes we are healed means by his stripes we are complete. 
We need Jesus for that. There is no other name anywhere. <laughs> there is no other person anywhere on this planet associated with this planet in any possible way from our history or our future other than Jesus that does that for any person. Okay? That is what's going on in this moment. Rise and go, your faith has made you well. He was already healed physically. What Jesus was proclaiming here wasn't his physical healing. He'd already got that moments before. What he was getting was, you're in eternity now. You're living with a bit of heaven inside you. You're acting for the purposes of kingdom of heaven. Go. You're now well. That is quite radically different than the words that we normally associate with healing. But that's, what, that's what's going on, I believe, in every passage that it talks about Jesus healing. And I, I would challenge each, each of us to take a look at all those incredible healings and just see what's really going on. Certainly Jesus had compassion to heal people physically, driving demons out and, and releasing them from epilepsy and what have you. Yeah, that, that's, that's the service he was doing. But he was coming to save. He was releasing people into the purposes of God. So, what's that mean for us? Well, this ministry of salvation means that that's the main thing. And healing is all the byproducts that come out of that salvation. If you have experienced His love and you've responded to that love, you're, you're right there. You're, you're right, right, in, right in His hand. And all that it takes is a, the acknowledgement that that is your Heavenly Father. Jesus is, is your friend, sure, but He's your Savior. The challenge, I suppose, as, as we get along here, and, and I would like to say when they yell, have pity on us. Their thought is, we have leprosy. What they should have been saying is, have mercy on us. We're foul creatures. And we need the love of God to fix us. Right? So our challenge then should be to continually seek the mercy of God in His love. It's not just because you're a sinner that you need Him. It's because He loves you, too. <laughs> We're not going to a God that hates us. We're going to one that's showing us love through Christ, but can't handle sin in His presence. Have mercy on us, O God, because of Your love of your own great love. That's what we should be seeking. That's what we should be letting people know as well. Second, I think we need a, a greater experience of giving Him praise. We say thanks pretty quickly, I think. And I, and I think we're, we're fairly quick, as, especially as Canadians, to say, sorry, God. Messed up again. Thank you for overlooking that one or whatever, right? But I think we need to experience giving Him praise just in everything. I, I've told you before how when you come up to a stoplight, you should thank Him for a red light as well as, as a green light. Green light accommodates you. Red light doesn't accommodate you, but you should be thankful for it anyway. Obviously, that's a little simpler than what's going on here, but... We should give God thanks just all the time. 
always giving him thanks and experience giving him thanks because giving him thanks just seems to open things up opens the the door I, I suppose or the window I guess of heaven that we might experience that that touch of God's presence or or that direction in life that we need for that moment or or even just the assurance that we need continually this is how fragile the human hearts are I guess we need continual assurance of God's presence well, experience giving him praise and you'll have that that's that's the wonderful thing about God he, he can't help but respond to the praises of his people when it's done truly in, in, in heart, right? Just singing a song isn't quite enough. You actually have to be in praise to him. Thirdly, we need to complete the, 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 complete the healing of our, of our own lives by receiving his full salvation. People seem to have the, the idea that I need to do things to get ahead in life. And that's kind of the way the world works. They, they take that over to their personal lives and become quite selfish in those pursuits. And happiness is one of those things, and I've mentioned that before. This is not the primary goal of our life, is to be happy. That's a byproduct of some of the goals of our life. Finding your purpose in life is a primary goal. When you find your per primary purpose, it brings happiness, or can bring happiness. That's a byproduct of the primary goal. But people really, these days, have this philosophy, personal philosophy, I need to be happy. No, you don't. You, you need to be saved. <laughs> you, need to, you need to be humble and give thanks to God. That's what you need to do. Uh, and doing that, there'll be the joy of the Lord, which will make you happy, right? Byproduct again. So as, as we start to look at all of those things in our lives, and you start to push those things out that are byproducts, or make them at least secondary instead of primary in your life, and you start to open more space and more space and more space for, for the love of God to fill those areas. It changes us. That's looking along those same lines of finding the completeness in His salvation. It's not just so you can get into heaven. Okay? We have that mentality that we need to make sure we get in the gates. I had that. I don't care what it is that the Lord wants me to do. I just want to get in the gate so I'm in. Again, that's kind of secondary, to be honest. The primary is that I might see the face of Almighty God. Right? Like, our primary purpose is to have a relationship with the Father. It's not just to get in the gates. It's not just to avoid hell. It's to actually have a relationship with the Holy One. That's, that's what we're doing. That is salvation. What are you being saved for? For God. What are you being saved from? For the absence of God. That's what you're being saved from. Like, that's really what's going on. It's not this geographic location of heaven and a geographic location of hell, and we don't want to go there, we want to go there. That's not the primary. That's just, that's what happens, but that's not the primary. So we need to reestablish biblical principles of what's going on in our uh, in our Christian walk and, and doing that I think helps on our side of it find that understanding of completing our salvation uh, the Bible talks about work out your salvation in fear and trembling and it's kind of stumped me for a long time. How do I work that out? All I had to do was say yes to Jesus, right? Like that was it. Well, yes, at the beginning you do say yes to Jesus, but hey, you're working it out as well. You're understanding what his salvation is, and his salvation isn't just a once and done thing of saying yes, and now I'm in the gates. It's saying yes, now I'm on a journey to the presence of the Father. And that's the rest of our life. 
So let's draw to completion this, this salvation that we've been talking about. Let's work it out with fear and trembling that we might actually experience the fullness of God even before we get into His presence in heaven. That's, that's the heart of the Father for us. Is that the heart of us for Him? I hope it is. I pray it is. Something that I've been checked on a number of times. But again, last week. And, and I'm okay with that. Is making sure that people know not just that God loves them, but that we can actually say yes to Jesus. Right? It's not just put out there, oh, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. You need to come to Him. And so today, I'm not going to make any assumptions. I'm, I'm not going to assume everybody here knows Jesus. If you know Jesus, praise God. If you don't, He's inviting you to know Jesus. Okay? That's, that's really really important and I'll tell you why and, and this is the, the, the deal because I, I've had that question posed to me quite a bit we should be making an invitation all the time well I agree but maybe in church isn't the place <laughs> because people generally aren't coming looking for Jesus in the church nowadays to be honest the people who are in the church already know him but I have an uncle who, for years, went to church, and out of the blue, the pastor one day said to him, or said to the congregation, oh, I haven't done this in a long time, I should just say, hey, does anyone, anyone want to accept Jesus today? And he said, yeah, I do. <laughs> it, was, it was a shock. Everybody thought he, he was a, a Jesus follower. He'd been coming because it's a good thing to do on a Sunday morning. He'd been coming because that, that was his habit. He would, he'd been coming because he liked music. He, he liked being together. He liked the fellowship. He, he liked church. But he didn't even know Jesus. So before we go to communion, I'm just going to give an invitation. I, I know most of you pretty well. And I'm assuming some things all the time. But it's not really between you and me, it's between you and Jesus. The, the words from 1 Corinthians 11 that Paul gives to the, the church about communion addresses that in a way. I've said it this way before, we need to keep short accounts with God. We, we need to make sure that we're you know, on the same page with him. Not him or with us, but us with him. Hey, Lord, is there anything that stands between us in our relationship? Well, if you don't know Jesus, that could do it. That could stand between you. And so, as we, as we prepare for communion, I think it's also a thing that we just revisit. Where are we standing with God? Maybe you've been a bit distant. You've been showing up. You've been enjoying the music, enjoying seeing people, whether they're masked or whatever. I'm just saying you've been, you've been enjoying church somehow and you haven't really felt God's presence. Or maybe you've been hiding. Maybe you haven't said yes to Jesus. Maybe you need that invitation. In either case, let's just check our hearts as, as we... As we take in the words of, of uh, Paul, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And, and those are the words that stand out to me. Not so much because I don't know Jesus. Because sometimes we know Jesus, but we take him for granted. Much like, in some ways, these, these guys that came to him for help did in Luke 11. And so I've in the past said, well, this is an open table. It doesn't matter what background you have as long as you, as long as you know Jesus. And I assume you know Jesus. But the reality is, you better know Jesus. That's what the words here are saying. You really need to know him. So I'm going to give an invitation. And I'm just going to ask you to do those two things. Check your heart. Make sure you keep short accounts. And in the process, where are you at with Jesus? Are you distant? So distant you don't even know him? Or distant enough that you, you really should come back close, close, close to the heart of the Father? In the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I, I'm feeling very compelled today to make sure that we all understand what checking our hearts mean. And it's not just simply, oh, do I need to say sorry quickly so I can move on? It, it really is, do I know Jesus? Have, have I let him as, as Savior, be the Lord of my life too? I know that He's the Savior of the world, but is He my Savior? I know that He's the Lord of heaven and earth, but is He my Lord? He's a friend to sinners, but is He a friend to this sinner? I do need to make it personal. I need to make sure. And I need to make certain that I... I put it out to everybody else. And so I just throw the invite out. If you know Jesus, praise God. If you're distant from Him, or you haven't actually said, Lord, be, be Lord of my life, I invite you to do that right now. It's a simple thing. It's just a simple prayer, really. Oh, Lord. It, it, it sounds sort of like this, but it has to be in your words, not mine. It, it's just a thing of saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I realize that I can only come to you in faith, believing that you heal me completely. Whether it's my mind, my heart, my body, or my soul, it's only you that can fully heal me and make me whole. So I've come before possibly and said sorry so that I could get a healing, but I want to make sure, I want to make sure I'm in the kingdom. I want to make sure I'm going to, I'm going to have a relationship with you, Jesus. And having said Yes to Jesus. Be assured, the Bible says, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, Lord, if there's anyone who has that sense about them that they need you, you're as close as the mention of your name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I ask and pray that you would confirm it on their hearts 
confirm it by that, that measure of healing that comes with, with saying, I need you, Lord. There's just something about saying, I need you, Lord, that changes the whole spiritual dynamic in us. And so if anyone has accepted that invitation that you're giving, praise God. For anyone who has been distant, Lord, pray that as they have come a step closer and a step closer and a step closer, you've done the same thing and they, they sense your presence. There's nothing like being in the presence of a holy God. It's wonderful and terrible at the same time. Wonderful if you know him. Terrible if you don't. I pray you'd bless our hearts today as we have taken the time to consider, taken the time to check out where we're at with you. And for those who have given themselves to you, I pray that you would bless the, the emblems now. Give each of us that, that sense of, of being on the right path, going the right direction with you, so that as we take of the, the, the wafer and, and the juice, we we're actually doing what Paul is saying here. We're, we're proclaiming your death until you return. That, that death that brought us salvation. That death that brought us healing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's eat the bread together. healing, the complete and, and whole healing. Thank you. You are our King. You are the Savior of our souls. You are our Lord. And we proclaim your name. We, we don't just call on your name, we claim it too. We, we call ourselves Jesus followers. We call ourselves Christians because you're, you're our Lord. You're our Savior. Thank you. Thank you. Bless your name. Bless your name. Bless your name. sing one more song and then uh, anyone who would like prayer I'd love to pray for you so why don't you stick around for a couple of extra moments and we'll just pray together and we'll just really believe that the, the Lord is working some, some incredible things out would you stand with us as we, as we sing you are my king you were 
forsaken I'm accepted You were condemned And I'm alive and well Your spirit is within me Because you died and rose again Let's sing that again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again You, my King, would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned and I'm alive and well your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again amazing love amazing love It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. today. This is so key. It's so straight to the point. This amazing love. It, 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 it begs this question, how can it, you're the king that you would die for me? And I know it's true. I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you. Lord, as we go into this next week, I pray that we would go with such enthusiasm for your heart that we don't see the, the trouble around us. 
We don't, we don't see the difficult tasks ahead of work or school. We just see that we're working for you. And, and it might be some early mornings and late nights. It might be some difficult discussions that we have to have. It might be some terrible situations that we're in. But we're doing this for you because we're yours. Bless you. Bless you, Lord, as you bless us. See each of us through this week in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So if you have any prayer requests, please come up and, and, and just let me know what it is. I'll grab my mask. We'll, we'll have a little prayer time. And uh, real, real short. It won't take anybody's time. And if, if, if you just need to talk about what Jesus means to you, reach out, would you? Tell, tell somebody. Tell me. Let me know. So we can chat about things, okay? Blessings all. Have an excellent week.